Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our 12th session on the tafsir of Surat Fatir, which is the 35th chapter of the Quran. And alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number 39. Uh, before we begin, just a reminder, just to make sure that we, we contextualize these verses, Surat Fatir, as we've mentioned several times, is a, is a Meccan surah. It was revere, revealed during the, the, the middle Meccan period. And therefore, <clears throat> many of the, the theological discussions address the Mushrikeen of Mecca. Now, it's important for us to understand the religious beliefs of of the Meccans, because they are effectively the primary audience, the primary addressees in many of these verses. Now, the Mushrikeen of Mecca were polytheists. They were idol worshippers. However, they did believe in Allah. They did recognize a higher power, but they believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was too sublime for them to interact with. They believed that he was the, the higher God whose primary function was to create. You know, this is why the Quran in many verses says, you know, If you ask them who created, now the key word is, Man who created the heavens and the earth. They would, without a doubt, they would surely say that it is Allah. So the Meccans, the people that the Prophet is speaking to, the people that the ver these verses are directed to, they believe in God. They believe that Allah is the creator. So what, what aspect of Tawheed did, do they reject? So they believe that Allah is the only creator. They don't believe that the, the idols created the universe. They believe that Allah is the creator of the universe. Now, so their shirk is related to what aspect of Tawheed? Their shirk is, in fact, related to Rububiya. So they believe that Allah is the sole creator but they believe that the idols are their sustainers and protectors. And it's, you know, in some ways, it's very similar to, to many people today who believe in God. You know, they, they, they believe that God is the creator, but they may place more confidence in, in other things, in other institutions, in other deities. So they believe that God is the sole creator, but when it comes to their day-to-day -to, their day -to -day lives and the managing of their affairs, they invoke, they invoke the, the idols. And we'll see that this is uh, important in the, uh, in the verses that we'll be discussing today. So that just to kind of give you, uh, uh, kind of to contextualize and give you a simple understanding of the religious beliefs of the, the idol worshippers of Mecca, the polytheists of Mecca. Now, verse number 39. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa alladhi ja'alakum khala'ifa fil ard. Faman kafara fa'alayhi kufru. Wa la yazidu al-kafirin kufruhum inda rabbihim illa maqta. Wa la yazidu al-kafirin kufruhum illa khasara. It is he who appointed you as vicegerents upon the earth. So whoever disbelieves, his disbelief is to his detriment. And the disbelief of the disbelievers does not increase them in the sight of their Lord except in hatred. And the disbelief of the disbelievers does not increase them except in loss. Now, from the first part of the verse, again, the first phrase 
the first part of the ayah is a strong uh, repudiation of the the idea that Allah is just a creator and is not involved in the affairs of human beings. Here Allah says, he has made you, he has made human beings vicegerents upon the earth. So this, so the concept of deism is, is very clearly refuted by this verse. That Allah is not only the creator, he appoints, he engages his creation. So he appointed you as vicegerents upon the earth. Now, the word khala'if is the plural of khalifa. And in the Arabic language, it's possible for a, a single word to have many plural forms. So khalifa and khala'if, and then khalifa can also become khulafa. So the word khala'if is the plural of khalifa. So the verse is essentially saying that it is he who has made you, made human beings, khalifas upon the earth. Now, what, is, what does it mean when Allah says that he has made human beings khalifas upon the earth? Now, when you look at the, the commentaries, the various uh, commentaries on this verse, you see that there are some mufassirin who have who have more mystical inclinations who argue that every human being is khalifatullah every human being is a representative of god meaning that of all of the the beings that god has created the human being has the highest potential of manifesting and reflecting the divine attributes. Now, everything in creation is a reflection of God's attributes. Some creatures have a higher capacity to manifest the, the divine attributes, and others have, a, have less of a capacity. So some Mufassirin argue that khala'if here means that God has made human beings, his khalifas upon earth, meaning that they all have within themselves, they've been endowed with an ability, with a capacity to cultivate within themselves the beautiful names of God. So when a human being shows compassion, when they strive to be merciful and forgiving and knowledgeable and so on and so forth, they become mirrors that uh, reflect the, the beautiful names of God. Another opinion is that human beings are khalifas, not of God, because the verse doesn't explicitly say that he appointed you as vicegerents who represent him. So Khalifa basically, it, it literally means the one who comes after or the one who represents. You know, this is why, you know, the, the, the leader after the Prophet is known as Khalifa to Allah, the one who is left behind and who occupies the position of the Prophet in his absence. So some scholars contend that Khalaif means that all human beings represent God. They have the ability to act as uh, the vicegerents of God on earth. Other, other mufassirin, they say that no, khala'if does not mean that God has made all human beings his khalifas. Rather, the meaning of the, the verse is that Allah has made human beings the khalifas of their predecessors. So human beings are inheritors. They are the vicegerents of the past generations. So, and, and this is, and if you look at the, the commentaries, Allama Taba Tawai, Ayatollah Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, they, they lean to this, towards the second view, that all human beings who are alive are 
the Khalaf, they are the Khalifas of those who passed away. So we are the inheritors of the, the past generations. Now, now obviously, Khalifa here, when Allah speaks about Khalifa, this is not the same as the, the position of Khilafa that Allah has bestowed upon prophets and messengers and imams. So when Allah speaks about Khilafa, the divinely appointed Khilafa, for instance, in the case of Dawood, Allah says in Surah Sa'd, verse 26, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alna ka khalifatan fil ard. O David, who is speaking Allah, indeed we have made you a vicegerent upon the earth. Now this is not the same as that, you know, so even if we subscribe to the, to the idea that all human beings are khalifatullah, we have to make a distinction between the khilafah that was bestowed upon the likes of Dawood and Adam and others and the general uh, khilafah that all human beings have been endowed with. If we subscribe to that view. فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ so, so judge between the people in truth. So this khilafa, which is bestowed upon prophets, messengers, and imams, is a very unique type of khilafa. And this is a type of divine authority. It's a mandate that Allah has given to certain individuals to act as his official representatives whereby they communicate the will of God. Now, you and I, as average people, even if we, even if we say that we are all the khalifas of God in a general sense, that doesn't mean that we are representatives of God or that we communicate the will of God. So obviously, there is a, there is a general khilafah. So even according to those Mufassirin who believe that this verse means that all human beings have been given this position of Khalifatullah, we need to make it very clear that there is a general Khilafa and there is a specific special Khilafa which is bestowed upon uh, the choicest of God's servants who represent God in an official capacity and who communicate uh, His will to the people that they've been commissioned to guide. So obviously, this type of khilafah differs from the general khilafah of, uh, that is given to human beings. Again, if we go to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse uh, 30, again, Adam is appointed as khalifatullah. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً in this case, Adam, قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءُ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And when your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place on the earth a vicegerent, they said, will you place in it one who shall make mischief in it and shed blood? While we celebrate your praise and sanctify you, he said, surely I know what you do not know. So even the response of the angels shows that they were trying to make the case for themselves to act as the khalifas of God, meaning to be the official representatives of God who communicate his, his will. So because of their past experience with human beings, they assumed that Adam would be no different from uh, the human-like creatures that roamed the earth. So therefore, because of this great distinction between the khilafah that God gives to prophets and messengers and imams and ordinary people, and based even on the context of the verse, Alama Tabatabai argues and, and this is actually a very convincing, uh, a very compelling argument that he makes. He says that, you know, human beings 
can be divided into two groups based on the, the present moment. You have the Salaf, which refer to our predecessors, those who lived before us, who've passed away. And then you have the Khalaf. The Khalaf are those who come after. You know, so we would be the Khalaf, and our ancestors who passed away would be the Salaf. You know, and this is why uh, you have a certain sect within Islam who identify as the Salafis, because they believe that they are following a more orthodox uh, version of Islam that's based on the practice of the Salaf, that's based on the practice of those early, the first generation of Muslims. So, so we are the, the Khalaf, and our predecessors, our ancestors are the, the Salaf. So based on this uh, interpretation, the verse is essentially asserting that God is not just the creator, but he's, he's involved in the affairs of his creation, and he has made us inherit the resources of the earth that our ancestors possessed. So we are their khalifas. So we've inherited from them. Now, so this verse essentially states that God made us inherit. And khalifa does convey the idea of inheriting something from the one who came before you. That God has made us. He's given us the ability to procreate. And because we are mortal, because our lifespans are brief on this earth, you know, one generation passes away and the next generation are their khalifas. They are the inheritors. So Allah will hold us responsible for the way that we made use of those blessings. The things that we inherit are are things that God will hold us accountable for. So, and there is also the implicit message that this life is transient. You know, the, if, if Allah made us the khalifas upon the earth, that implies that there were those who came before us who passed away. And we will one day pass away, and then another generation will come after us. And they will be our khalifas, and we will be the salaf in relation to them. So this makes you think about, you know, what we are doing with the blessings that we have inherited from those who came before us. And that that's and this applies to the material blessings that we inherit. You know, in many cases, we inherit infrastructure, we inherit organizations, we inherit masajid, we we inherit knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going back to the verse, it is he who appointed you as vicegerents upon the earth. What we have our, at our disposal today is because of this divine system that Allah created. Number one, the fact that we can procreate and the fact that our predecessors, Allah decreed a certain amount of time for them on earth. They passed away and then because of that, we uh, inherited uh, the resources that they left behind. So this essentially goes back, and this is why I mentioned uh, the belief system of the Mushrikeen of Mecca. They reject, they believed in Tawheed al Khaliqiyah, but they rejected Tawheed al Rububiyyah. They rejected this idea that God is intimately involved in the affairs of human beings. فَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَعَلَيْهِ كُفُرَ Whoever rejects, whoever disbelieves, his disbelief, his kuf is to his detriment. Now, again, and this is a very common theme in the Quran, our defiance of God, our rejection of the truth hurts nobody but ourselves. Allah is the Almighty. He's not affected. In fact, even when we harm others, as we've mentioned several times, we inflict harm upon ourselves first and foremost before anyone else. 
فمن كفر فعليه كفر if you reject if you insist on defying and ignoring and denying then it's to your own detriment you you will suffer the consequences now of course you know sometimes when we read these verses especially as mu'minin as believers we we have this tendency that when allah speaks about kuf or kuffar we automatically assume that the verse is not talking about us now it's possible for you know there are different types of kufr there are different levels of kufr now yes we're not kufar in the sense that we don't believe in god that's 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 the highest you know uh, the most uh, egregious form of kufr is to deny god's existence outright but there are certain shades of kufr that are even found uh among mu'minin among believers and one of the most uh pronounced instances of kuf that affects mu'minin is kufran al-ni'ma you know to reject the the blessings of god to to not be grateful to be ungrateful for the blessings that allah has bestowed upon us so it's important for us to reflect on what we have inherited from our predecessors and what we have inherited from them is ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore you find again going back to the, the the you know the theme of this phrase is that when Allah says faman kafara fa'alihi kufru kufr in all its forms in its most egregious form and in in its most subtle form in its most deceptively benign form it's all self harm whether you're rejecting god's existence outright or you're denying or you're uh, you're denying his favors or you give credit to others where you misplace your gratitude this is also a form of kuf to to ignore god in the equation is a form of of self harm now the rest of the ayah the rest of verse number 39 is really an elucidation it's it's a it's an explanation of of what this self harm actually means what do we mean when we say faman what does allah mean when he says faman kafara fa alayhi kufr here allah explains he elaborates wala yazidu al kafirin kufruhum 'inda rabbihim illa maqta وَلَا يَزِيدُ الْكَافِرِينَ كُفْرُهُمْ إِلَّا خَسَارًا And the disbelief of the disbelievers does not increase them in the sight of their Lord except in hatred. So one of the consequences of kuf is that you incur the wrath of God. You incur the wrath of Allah. You know, that's one of the reasons why this is a type of self harm because what is what does it mean to incur the wrath of god to incur the wrath of god is essentially to deprive yourself of his special mercy it's to expose yourself to his punishment and this is a type of harm that you're you're inflicting upon yourself why are you denying yourself allah denying yourself uh, of his uh, special mercy and number 2 ولا يزيد الكافرين كفرهم الا خسارة that it results in loss and the squandering of the precious gift of life Allah has given you the opportunity to secure eternal bliss in exchange for a few years 50 60 70 years of hardship of toil of struggle this is a great loss if someone you know if someone doesn't take advantage of this small trial which will yield everlasting uh prosperity now speaking of you know the the wrath of god it's important to to really understand what this means now of course the wrath of allah is very different 
from the wrath and the anger of human beings. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath is not a change within him. You know, when you and I get angry, there is a physiological change that happens uh, within us. When we're happy, when we're sad, these represent changes in emotional state. But when Allah is angry, Allah does not change. Allah is absolutely perfect. Because if Allah changed, it would imply that there was something, there was, there was something that was lacking and there was an adjustment that had to be made. There is no change in, in his essence. Therefore, his anger is his punishment. And his pleasure is the act of his reward. It goes back to uh, his attributes of, of action, his relational attributes. So Imam Zain al-Abidin in a dua, in one, one excerpt of his duas that can be found in Sahif al-Sajjadiyya, he says, Ilahuna wa Sayyiduna, our Lord and our Master, in ghafart fabifadlik. Oh Allah, if you forgive, it is by your grace. It is by your fadl. Meaning that no creature is deserving or entitled to your pardon. In fact, Allah would be justified in punishing a creature for all of eternity for one, for a single sin. Because of how heinous the act is to defy and to, to disobey the master and the creator of the heavens and the earth, that, that this small, insignificant creature who is fully dependent has the audacity to disobey God. I mean, this is a, an egregious offense. So Imam says, in that it is by your grace. If you forgive, it's by your grace. And if you punish, it is, it is by your justice. That there is no there is no such thing as cruel and unusual punishment. God's justice, God's punishment, his wrath is always based on his absolute justice. And the reason why we may think that certain punishments for certain sins seem to be extreme, it's because we don't understand who has been defied, and nor do we understand the nature of the sin itself. We think that it's not a big deal. It's because we don't understand the reality of uh, and, and the, the repugnant nature of these sins. Oh, the one whom nothing is sought except his grace. This is all we want from Allah. We're not asking Allah to give us what we deserve because we don't deserve anything. We don't even deserve to exist. Everything is just out of His grace. We exist purely out of His grace. So to say that I'm entitled to anything beyond existence is, is, uh, is silly. وَلَا يُخْشَى إِلَّا عَدْلًا وَلَا يُخْشَى إِلَّا عَدْلًا And nothing is feared except His justice. So when we speak about the the wrath of God. We're we're not we're not afraid of this arbitrary, unreasonable punishment. What we fear is his justice, and what we hope in is his uh, grace. So again, Kuf incurs the wrath of God, and it 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 puts a person in a deep sense of regret that we sh that I should have made better use of my time. I should have made a better effort to become more acquainted with my creator. That was the most important relationship uh, for me to cultivate and develop. Yet, I, yet Allah was always the last priority in my life. And the day the wrongdoer will regret, will bite on his hands in regret. He will say, oh, I wish I had taken the messenger 
the messenger's way, with the messenger away. Meaning that I wish I followed these messengers and these prophets so they could have led me to my creator. So they could have introduced me and helped me and assisted me in developing and nurturing this relationship with my creator. This is a very uh, interesting narration from Amir al-Mu'mineen, which again goes back to the, the idea of inheriting from our predecessors. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, إِنَّ أَعْظَمَ الْحَسَرَاتِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حَسْرَةُ رَجُلٍ كَسَبَ مَالًا فِي غَيْرِ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ فَوَرِثَهُ رَجُلٌ فَأَنْفَقَهُ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ فَدَخَلَ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَدَخَلَ الْأَوَّلُ بِهِ النَّارِ Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says the greatest of regrets on the day of resurrection will be the regret of a man. Of course, this is not you know, gender specific. The regret of a person who gained wealth through means of disobedience to God. They amassed their wealth through unlawful means. Which then, so this person will be, will be in so much pain on the day of judgment, will be in a, in a state of great remorse. Why? Because this person accumulated wealth unlawfully, which was then inherited by a person who spent it in the obedience of God. Thus, because of it, because of the same wealth, the latter entered paradise, whereas the former entered the fire. And this is something for us to consider, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us opportunities. He's given us resources. There are some who use the same resources and they, they, they gain Jannah. And there are others who use the same resources and they end up in hell. I'll give you a simple example. Many of us are blessed with parents. Allah has given us parents. And parents are one of the most effective ways to earn the pleasure of Allah and to ultimately earn paradise. The way that you treat your parents is essentially, you know, can be a gateway to paradise. And this is why, you know, when some of the companions of the Prophet, when they would lose parents, they would lose a mother or a father, they would cry. And when they would be asked, you know, why are you crying? They would say, you know, كَانَ لِي بَابَانِ مَفْتُوحَانِ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ فَأُغْلِقَ أَحَدُهُمَا They would cry and they would say that, I had two doors that opened up and entered into paradise, two gates to paradise, and one of them has closed. So, you know, we, we have parents. Some of us may enter Jannah because of how we treat our parents, and others will enter Jahannam because of the way they treated their parents. Similarly, there are people whom Allah gives them money. They use that money to earn the pleasure of Allah to do something that is pleasing to Allah, and others will use money to incur the wrath of God. So what's painful on the Day of Judgment is that there will be people who will see that the same resources that they were given, and because of their misuse of those resources, they are punished, and others will use those resources more wisely, and they earned the pleasure of Allah and they gained through paradise. They gained that paradise because of the way that they uh, used those resources. Verse number 40. <laughs> فهم على بينة من بل بل إن يعد الظالمون بعضهم بعضا إلا غرورا. Say, have you considered your partners whom you invoke besides God? 
show me what they have created from the earth. Or have they partnership with him in the heavens? Or have we given them a book so they are standing on evidence therefrom? No, rather the wrongdoers do not promise each other except delusion. Now this is one of the, the sev one of several ayats in the Quran <clears throat> that challenge <clears throat> the mushrikeen, the polytheists, to bring forth proof that their objects of worship do indeed have the powers that they claim. <clears throat> and this is this is really a very important message because historically, especially you know in the West, faith seems to be faith has always been synonymous with belief that is not based in evidence. In fact, faith, you know, in in uh, in the English language has the connotation that this is an idea that is embraced, that is accepted despite lack of evidence. Interestingly, when you look at the Quran, the Quran rebukes the mushrikeen. Not just because of their idol worship, but because they are making, they believe in things without evidence. And therefore, it's important for us as Muslims not to adopt that same practice where we believe in things, but we don't have rational evidence, nor do we have textual evidence. We always have to have a dalil. You know, Islam is a tradition whose ideology and theology is based on evidence, based on either rational proofs or scriptural proofs. So, these mushrikeen make all these claims about their deities. Allah challenges them. What's your evidence? What's your proof? So this is training Muslims to ask for evidence when they are presented with a belief or an idea. What's the evidence? Why should I accept this idea? So this verse and several others address the inability of their gods to create. So again, this is a Quranic challenge. It's challenging the belief system of the Meccans because they don't have evidence, because they're making claims about uh, the world. So this is a, a challenge to the ontology of the mushrikeen. Allah in Surah, uh, Surah Yunus, verse number 34, he says, Again, Allah begins with a rhetorical question to get them thinking about why they believe what they believe. Say, are there of your partners, these beings, these idols, these deities that you ascribe and you believe are partners to God, are there, are there of your partners any who begins creation and then repeats it? Are you worshiping something that has the power to bring something into existence? Are you worshiping something that has the power to recreate, to bring something back to life? What, and what's the answer? No. Only Allah. Only Allah has that ability. <inaudible> Say, God begins creation and then repeats it. <inaudible> so how are you so deluded? So this is profound, especially when you, when you contextualize these verses, that these verses were revealed at a time in, an, in a place in the world where education and especially literacy was very low and people believed in superstitions and therefore you find the Quran here encouraging people 
to think about why they believe what they believe and to try to bring forth evidence to substantiate their claims. And if they're not able to substantiate their claims, they should relinquish those beliefs and ideas and exchange them for a belief system that is evidence-based. So the following verse negates all power from the deities they worship. So you see the, the logical, the intellectual argumentation that the Quran is making. So this verse negates all power from the deities they worship other than God. So not only are they weak, not only can they not create, and not only are they not able to bring things back to life, they are utterly and absolutely powerless. So on what basis are you worshiping these things? But they have taken besides him gods which create nothing while they are created. Not only that, not only can they not create, they do not possess and possess not for themselves any harm or benefit. They're not even, they have no control even of themselves. They can't bring, they cannot draw in any benefit and nor can they repel any harm from themselves. They're utterly helpless. They don't have and possess not power to cause death or life or resurrection. So the only thing that is worthy of worship is something that is absolutely powerful, that is the source of, of life, that has the ability to take away life and to restore it. So it, it would be humiliating for the human being to worship something that is limited and weak. But the only being that is worthy of worship that will liberate the, the, human, the human soul from its limitations is to connect to that absolute reality. Again, another rhetorical question that Allah is asking the mushrikeen of Mecca is Am lahum shirkun fi samawat? or have they partnership with him in the heavens these idols these deities that you worship do you think that they are they have a partnership with Allah there's a, in sermon 31 of Nahjul Balagha Amir al-Mu'minin he says to his son and there's a debate over whether this is Imam al-Hassan or Muhammad ibn al hanafiya In any case, who the addressee is not that important. The, what's important is the, the message. The Imam here speaks about one of the intuitive proofs for the oneness of God. You know, we often speak about proving the existence of God, but it's also important to prove the oneness of God because historically, one of the biggest problems of human beings is shirk. You know, kufr is not that common. Even those who claim to be atheists, if you really look at their, uh, their belief system, it's more accurate to either call them agnostics or uh, mushrikeen. اعلم يا بني أنه لو كان لربك شريك لأتتك رسوله No, O oh my son. If there had been a partner with your Lord, his messengers would have surely come to you. If you look at all the prophets, the biblical prophets, prophets mentioned in Torah, the prophets, whether it's Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, Harun, Yahya, all of them, they all preached that there is one God, there is one creator. They were all sent by the same creator. Now, Amir al-Mu'mineen argues here that if God had a partner, that God would have revealed himself by sending messengers, that his messengers would have come to you. But all of those who successfully, uh, who claimed to be prophets and who were by and large accepted as prophets, among the 
the uh, the religious communities, especially the Abrahamic traditions, they all we all see that they were dispatched by a single creator. And you would have seen signs of his authority. You would see patterns in the universe that indicate, that reveal two deities. And you would have known his deeds and his qualities. The fact that the structure of atoms is the same throughout the universe. There is a uniformity. There is a, a singularity with respect to the laws that govern the universe. This is all evidence that the creator of the universe is one because there is a unity that exists in the world of creation. There's a uniformity. There's an interconnectedness that can be observed. Here's a, an interesting hadith, and I know that we're running out of time, but uh, speaking about, about uh, shirk, there, is, there was a, a, a dualist, a man who believed in two gods. He, he came to Imam al-Ridha, salam, and I really encourage you, brothers and sisters, to read the debates of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha. You know, his contributions to Aqaid are no less than the contributions of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq in fiqh. You know, so if Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Baqir made con major contributions in fiqh, uh, you see that Imam al-Ridha was able to go into great detail and explain the, the theology of Shia Islam in such a profound and convincing way that after Imam al-Ridha, the Shia community is essentially united when, when it comes to their theology. So that's why if someone believes in Imam al-Ridha, they typically believe in all 12 Imams. Whereas before Imam al-Ridha, you see that there are different theological sects that, uh, that, uh, that are created. So in any case, when a... Uh, لما سأله رجل من الثانوية Thanawiyya is dualism, the idea that the universe has two creators. So he says to Imam al-Ridha, إِنِّي أَقُولُ إِنَّ صَانِعَ الْعَالَمِ اثْنَانِ He said to Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, alayhi salam, I believe that the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, are two. فَمَا الدَّلِيلُ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ وَاحِدٌ He says, I believe that there are two creators. What is the proof that he is one, that the creator is one? So this man is asking Imam al-Ridha for proof that there's one God. Look at how the Imam brilliantly responds. He says, قَوْلُكَ إِنَّهُ إِثْنَانْ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ واحد. The Imam replied, saying that your belief that there are two is proof in itself that he is one. For verily, why? Because you verily you have only claimed the second after having affirmed the existence of the one. So, Imam al-Ridha believes in one creator. This man believes in two. So Imam al-Ridha is essentially saying that you say two because you've already affirmed that there has to be one. And that's why you've added a second one. So saying that there are two implies that you've already acknowledged that there's one. So then the Imam says, فَالْوَاحِدُ مُجْمَعٌ عَلَيْهِ وَأَكْثَرُ مِنْ وَاحِدٍ مُخْتَلَفٌ فِي so the one is already agreed upon. It is more than one that is controversial and remains to be proven. So the Imam, what, what's the Imam saying here? He's saying that the burden of proof is not on the monotheist. It's on the dualist and the polytheist because the common denominator 
among all of us is that there's one. We can all agree that there's one. So who needs evidence that there's more than one? The dualist has to prove that there's a second. The polytheist has to prove that there's many. Because once when you, when you agree that the universe needs a creator, that there can be no effect without a first cause, that first cause by default has to be at least one. So that is agreed upon. So Imam Radha is essentially saying that I should ask you what's your proof that there's a second. Because there is agreement, there is a consensus that there is at least one. So the one who needs to bring evidence, the burden of proof is on the one who says that there's a second. Not the one who, who argues that there's a single creator. Continuing the ayah, فهم على بينة من. So then Allah says, okay, if you don't have any rational evidence that there is more than one creator, do you at least have scriptural, scriptural evidence? Is this based on wahi, on revelation? Because we have to be honest, brothers and sisters, there are some things that we believe in that are not based on aql. Now, it's not that it contradicts aql, but there are certain things that are just beyond the grasp of human intellect. And, and therefore we default to revelation. There are many details about the afterlife that cannot be rationally proved. We simply believe in it because of dalil naqli. We believe in uh, transmitted or uh, scriptural evidence. So here Allah, this verse essentially repudiates the claim of the polytheist by asking were you given revelation that tells you that that tells them of the things that they claim? Okay, you can't prove your belief system through reason. Do you have a book? Is there a revelation? Is there a divine scripture that you're basing these ideas on? So those who ascribe partners to God lack both intellectual evidence as well as textual evidence to substantiate their claim. And this is also important for us. We always need to ask, what is the dalil aqli? What is the rational proof? And if there is no rational proof, at the very least, is there scriptural proof for this? Can Is this based on ayah of the Quran, on hadith? So we have to train ourselves to ask for evidence. Verse number 41, and I think we'll conclude with this one. Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wal arda an tazula wa la in zalata in amsakahuma min ahadim min ba'di innahu kan haliman ghafura. Indeed, God holds the heavens and the earth lest they seize. And if they should seize, no one can hold them in place after him. Indeed, he is forbearing. And forgiving. So again, this entire verse refutes this idea that God is only a creator. Allah sustains the universe. He maintains the universe. He upholds the universe. And if, if the universe were, were to collapse or to seize, you know, who, who can sustain it after him? Indeed, Allah is what? He's halim and ghafura. He is forbear, forbearing. And uh, forgiving. Again, there are many verses in the Quran that that uh, where Allah essentially asks us, you know, why do we feel so secure of God's punishment when we continuously defy Him? So feeling secure of divine wrath, as we've mentioned in our previous lessons, is a sin in and of itself. So you have these two extremes. Losing hope in God's mercy is a sin. And feeling immune from God's punishment is also a sin. So that's something that we have to reflect on. Now in this context, God is halim. He's, for, he's forbearing because he continues to sustain the universe despite the fact that the believers credit others with the sustaining of the universe. And Allah is ghafur because he, he consistently gives us opportunities to turn back to him and he's forgiving uh, towards those who sincerely uh, repent to him. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes our discussion for this evening. Uh, inshallah, I, I believe with the help of Allah, with 
tawfiq from Allah, we'll be able to conclude our tafsir of Surah Fatir next week. And uh, inshallah, after we uh, complete the tafsir of Surah Fatir, uh, we will begin uh, a very detailed uh, series on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. And this is still related to the Quran because when we study the seerah of the Prophet, uh, we're essentially studying you know, uh, the Quran in chronological order. Now that doesn't mean we're gonna go through every single verse in the Quran, but there will be plenty of Quranic references as we go through uh, a detailed analysis of the Prophet's life. And my hope is that as we go through uh, the life of the Prophet in elaborate and colorful detail, uh, this will actually enhance our understanding of the Quran because uh, the life of the Prophet is actually the backdrop of the Quran. So if a person lacks a, uh, a pro proficient knowledge uh, on the life of the Prophet, it makes the Quran very difficult to understand because it's difficult for you to contextualize a lot of the, the verses in the Quran. And furthermore, uh, if Allah gives us the ability, uh, perhaps after we finish the, uh, the life of the Prophet, we, we would be in a much better position to, uh, to study Nahjul Balagha. And, and maybe it might even require us to, to at least study the life of Imam Ali after the Prophet. And then I think we would be in a very good position to study Nahjul Balagha because we would have a good understanding of Islamic history. Because again, many of the sermons of Imam Ali السلام, in Nahjul Balagha make uh, references to certain historical events and uh, historical figures that if you did not know Islamic history, uh, you would have a lot of trouble uh, understanding and deciphering uh, the, the statements of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So that is hopefully something to look forward to. I hope that's that's good news. And uh, we pray that uh, we get to the tawfiq to, uh, to commence with that, uh, that series. Uh, Brother Zain, any questions or comments? And inshallah, we're really looking forward to the future lectures coming up. Uh, one question. So with uh, verses like this, which are uh, primarily addressed to the mushrikeen of Makkah, how did these verses reach their ears? Was was somebody just on the streets to, uh, saying the verse? Or how, how did those, how were the mushrikeen hearing the verses of the Quran? Very good question. Now, we have to understand that uh, that Mecca is not the Mecca that we think of today. You know, Mecca today is a heavily populated area, and you know, many people may not even know each other uh, in the Mecca of, in 2020. But at that time, uh, people knew each other very well, and um, a lot of these verses. Uh, because this is past the uh, the first three years of the Ba'tha where Islam was being propagated privately, Islam at this juncture in its early history is now uh, being publicly propagated. So many of these verses uh, were being uh, recited in public spaces. Uh, furthermore, because the Prophet and the Quranic verses were seen, you know, if I want to use modern day terminology, because they were seen as a threat to national security or threat to Meccan security, uh, they wanted to know. And uh, they waited anxiously for verses to be uh, recited because it allowed them to go, to collect information about Islam and the Prophet, and they needed to know what verses were being revealed so they can mount, so they would be able to mount a response and they could plan accordingly. So, uh, so because uh, this was uh, during the time in Mecca where Islam was now in the public domain, 
uh, these verses were accessible to the mushrikeen and um, and the mushrikeen themselves, uh, even though they were uh, very dis, uh, disenchanted by uh, by the prophet and his mission, it was you know it was uh, the equivalent of what we would call breaking news. So anytime a verse in the Quran, a verse of the Quran is revealed in Mecca especially because the prophet is starting to gain momentum i mean it, it's it it naturally attracts uh, the attention of quraysh uh, because it uh, it's seen as such a threat to the social order of mecca and the, their economic interests so they were very aware even if they even if they pretended to ignore the quran and they pretended not to care but the reality is when we look at the life of the prophet uh, many of them actually used to huddle outside of the Prophet's home to listen to the Qur'an because they were mesmerized by its linguistic uh, beauty and its, and its loftiness. So the Qur'an was sought out. I mean, it was something that they wanted to hear, but of course they, uh, they resisted and they opposed. So, so the Qur'an was, uh, it was being recited in public spaces and because of the threat that it posed, uh, the mushrikeen wanted, they had an interest in, in finding out what verses were being revealed. Oh, that's really interesting. Especially the national security angle. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's it, when you think about it that way, I think it, it makes you appreciate, you know, the, the psychology and the, the emotions that are involved uh, uh, during that time period, it, it was a very uh, there was a lot of tension between the Muslims and the Mushrikeen. So, uh, so yeah, it was definitely seen as a threat to uh, to their uh, to their social and economic uh, you know status quo. Uh, one, one thing that was interesting about these verses and and the hadiths that you mentioned was that the proofs that were being given about Tawheed were not really listed as a and there weren't to he approves that build stuff from the ground up they all started with a certain context that the person who's giving the proof and the person who's receiving it shared and it built up from there yeah like you you don't have like uh you, you wouldn't say to an atheist hey what's your proof that god like all these gods created the world but if somebody believes in some gods and especially if they believe in allah but other po smaller idols in addition to that then this question makes sense yeah yeah and, and i think that's important i think that you, you first have to establish some common ground before you can take the debate forward and that's why you know with the mushrikeen of mecca your your the basis of your argument is that okay we acknowledge that god exists and we build we build from that that uh that fundamental principle but with an atheist, you have to kind of go back to some and establish at least some basic uh, philosophical proofs. You might even have to go as far back as, you know, agreeing that there is such thing as an objective reality. So, so I, I think that, you know, one of the most important takeaways is that, you know, when you engage with other people, you have to first begin with those first uh, agreed upon principles. And for, for atheists, you have to, you might have to go a little bit back, but this could also be, uh, this could also carry the implicit, uh, an implicit message, which is that the belief in God, the belief in a higher power is, is something that is, that is assumed, meaning that the Quran seems to treat the existence of a creator as a self-evident truth. That it's something that almost doesn't even need to be proved because it's so self-evident. In the same way that, you know, scientists, you know, science is all predicated on a philosophical assumption. And that philosophical assumption really can't be proven. It's just, it's, it's accepted as true without any empirical evidence. And that is that, that there is an objective reality. You can't do science unless you assume that to be true. So if, if you ask any scientist today that, 
okay, I reject all of your scientific findings because, you know, I don't believe there, there, that there's an objective reality, that everything is just subjective and a fragment of my imagination. Prove to me empirically that there is an objective reality. They can't. So even science is built on certain self-evident truths, philosophical assumptions that are just agreed upon. The fact that you can trust your brain. You know, when scientists do science, they all assume that I can trust my mental judgments. But how? But, but why, why do you trust your mental judgments? How do you know your brain's not playing a trick on you? So the point that I'm trying to make is that we all have certain philosophical assumptions that we deem self-evident. So if, if, a, if an atheist scientist says that, you know, the, there is an objective reality and we just know and it's a self-evident truth. Okay, so why, why is that a self-evident truth, but God is not? Why, so why is it okay that you built your entire scientific enterprise on a self-evident truth that you can't empirically prove, but I am ridiculed for believing in, believing in God as a self-evident truth, even though I have additional arguments. But let's just say I have nothing, but I, I just have this gut feeling that he exists. In the same way that you have a gut feeling that there's an objective reality, I have a gut feeling, I believe that it's a self-evident truth that the universe has a creator. Why is your self-evident truth more valuable than my self-evident truth? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so I think these verses really teach us about the importance of establishing common ground and building off of those, those uh, philosophical assumptions. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. And and I, the, so I hadn't thought about how even with science, there is that assumption about the objective reality underneath. So that was, that was a really interesting concept right there. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yes, uh, one more, just one second, please. Yeah, um, so in the, uh... I'm sorry, Zane, I think you're cutting out. I don't, I don't hear anything. I'm sorry. So in, in verse 39, there seem to be two points being made. One about the vicegerency or inheriting, inheriting the earth. And the other one about disbelief being uh, on your own head, being bad for you. How do those two points relate to each other? And what... So I, again, the, you know, what, one of the important themes of this verse is that it is he who appointed you vicegerents upon the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just a creator, but he is the sustainer, the provider. And he appointed you as vice germs. You inherited from your predecessors. So, so whoever rejects, he says that kufr here can be, have a broad meaning, but from the context, one of, in this context, rejecting God's rububiyya, his lordship, the fact that he controls the affairs of the earth, to reject that is to your own detriment. So the relationship with kufr and this concept of khilafah goes back to an important aspect of tawheed, which is tawheed al rububiyya which is the oneness of God, that God is the sole provider and sustainer and the manager of, uh, of our affairs. So the, the idea, sorry, it's not quite clear to me. So it's the idea that because Allah has set up this, I, I guess it's almost not like this is a, a proof of Allah's existence. Or maybe could you elaborate on it a little bit more? I'm... No, so so the, the verse is not, it's not a, it's not a, Allah is not providing uh, 
a proof per se that that he is a, a proof of his his oneness. Rather, it's an, it's an invitation to reflect on the fact that you have these people who believe that that God is just a creator. He creates and then he steps back and he's not he's not involved in human affairs. Allah here is saying that he has appointed you as vicegerents upon the earth. He has created a system where number one, human beings can procreate. Number two, that, and this procreation is something that's ongoing. So because it's ongoing, it means that there's, there's divine involvement at every moment. Secondly, people die and then you have khalifas. So God decrees how long people live. And this is all in contrast to what the, the Mushrikeen believed, where God just creates and life and death and wealth and sickness is all governed by, de- by these idols. Allah says, no, all of this, everything that you inherit, all of the resources, whether it's longevity, whether it's wealth, whether it's health, all of these things, whether it's knowledge, these are things that are inherited because of the system that God has created, because he has apportioned certain lifespans for your predecessors because they were able to procreate. This is all an indication that the creator is not just the creator who is disengaged. He is a personal God who is involved in the affairs of human beings. So to reject God and to feel that he has no role in your life you're you're harming yourself by making that assumption that if that to feel that you are that you can find someone other than him to provide and to sustain and to find and to seek uh, sustenance and to seek your needs from other than him is an act of self harm and it's to your own detriment and by doing that you invoke God's wrath and you're you're uh, you're exposing your you're subjecting yourself to a great loss. Because the only way to live a prosperous life is to establish a connection with that creator who sustains you. Not these idols or not any of these uh, man-made systems or entities. The way to prosperity is to forge a relationship with that creator, sustainer, and provider. And those who reject that, who reject God as the provider and sustainer they 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 essentially uh, do that to their uh, to their own detriment at their own detriment so it's saying allah has you're living the system created by allah uh, reject that system at your own peril exactly well thank you very much sheikh exactly. oh sorry, one more one more question actually sorry yeah, yes assalamu alaykum sheikh how are Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yes, Alhamdulillah. It was a very, very informative uh, session. Uh, um, I have a question. Yeah. That um, all the riots, right from verse 39 to 41, they talk and discuss about a shirk jelly, the open manifest uh, apparent shirk. And um, this is talking about the idols and, you know, worshipping the other gods and associating partners with, uh, you know, your, uh, your natural creator. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what about uh, a shirk on khafi, which um, is commonly found in the monotheists, uh, you know, uh, the followers of uh, the only creator, because um, we also are totally involved in shirk most of the time. And, uh, you know, we give the rububia to ourselves and uh, the hawaun nafs, the ana, uh, which we have. So how do we get rid of that? And, uh, uh, you know, it's very, it, it's very easy and simple to explain to uh, the idolaters uh, about uh, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
but for people like us uh, who claim to be monotheists, um, you know, and have all kinds of idols inside us. So how do we treat that and how do we uh, demolish and get rid of those um, gods which, which are hidden inside us? Yes. You know, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, you know, in, in fact, you know, there are verses in the Quran where Allah says, you know, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ The majority, not the minority, the majority who profess a belief in Allah, they associate partners with Him. Not, not theoretically, in practice. You know, when... when uh, so you see that shirk al khafi as you mentioned, is, is a very difficult... Uh, type of shirk to uh, to get rid of because all all of us theoretically believe that God is the only provider theoretically we believe that God you know is the uh, he's he's the one who who he's a razak for example but practically when that belief is put to the test you see that on a practical level many of us uh, don't believe that right theoretically we may say that we believe it but but we don't, and I think that the way that that you that you rid yourself of a shirk al khafi is, you know, this is why it's important to. Uh, this is why dua is important. It's important, you know. Salah has that role. It, it plays a role, you know, being constantly connecting ourselves to uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And taking advantage, you know, and sometimes you you have to you have to talk to yourself as if you're a child, in the sense that you know you know we we speak so much about the importance of speaking to others and and watching what we say and and, and making sure that we reflect before we speak. But I think that we have to be we have to speak to ourselves sometimes, and we have to remind ourselves. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. And this is why, you know, one of the most beautiful narrations mentions that, you know, Imam, Imam Zain al Abidin, he had this habit that when he used to repair his sandals, he would ask Allah for help to give him the power to, re to repair his sandals. You know, and this is why, and, and I think that what would help is if we we start mentioning these things in our du'as. You know, we often uh, reserve our du'a for those, those the, the, major, the major life events. Oh Allah, grant me this and grant me that. But, you know, maybe we need to ask Allah, Oh Allah, give me the ability to walk tomorrow. Give me the ability to expel waste from my body. These are things that we take for granted. Oh Allah, you know, so all of the things that give you anxiety. So I think one practical thing that we can do to really develop this, uh, this awareness of Allah's rububiyyah is that, you know, think about all the things that you worry about. You know, think about paying your bills, about, you know, uh, you know, getting sick, whatever it may be. Include that in your dua. You know, this is why Allah says to Musa, Ya Musa, Selni kullama tahtaju ilay. Oh Musa, ask me about everything that you need. Don't think that any haja that you have is silly or trivial. Selni kullama tahtaju ilay. Hatta ala fa'a shatik wa milha ajinik. Allah says to Musa, ask me about everything that you need even if it's food for your sheep or salt for your food. So even, even in our salah, you know, it's mustahab when you stand, when you, when you rise up from sujood or tashahud, you say, بِحَوْلِ wa quwwatihi aqum wa aqud. It is by God's strength and power that I am able to stand up and sit. We say this every day, but I think that we have to we have to say it uh, uh, with presence of heart. So, and so I think that these little things that we do uh, will make a difference. You know, when you something as simple as when you lock your car, you know, you, 
you, you go you go to the grocery store and you lock your car door as you're going don't put confidence don't think that it's my alarm system that's going to protect my my car yes it's important for you to take the necessary measures to protect your car but in addition to hitting that that uh, the lock button make a quick dua oh allah protect my vehicle so these so g- developing these habits making these connections that even though i set my alarm my uh, my car alarm or i lock my door i know that allah is the ultimate protector when i take my medicine you know you have a headache you take an advil oh allah you know please relieve me of this this headache so you constantly remind yourself that the medicine the lock on my door these are all the means through which allah is protecting you or or curing you so i think that this to be more conscious uh, of these words will, will go a long way thank you very much sheikh may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you grant you a very very long life and keep you protected always and all the ulama hakh on my inshallah. Allah bless you. Thank you so much inshallah. We will meet again uh, uh next week for our final session on surah al-Fatihah and then uh, we'll be able to move forward after. We are looking forward for, uh, to hear from you the seerah of prophet uh, sallallahu alaihi I I've been waiting for a very long time to do it so I'm I'm happy that I'm going to be uh conducting it with you, know, yeah. you guys. You guys are definitely Okay. the most dedicated uh, group that I've worked with so may Allah bless you and reward us all for uh, and I think it's a very timely it's a, it's it's very timely for us to speak about the prophet giving what's happening giving uh, considering what's happening in the world and I pray that studying the life of the prophet will increase our mahabba and our love for him and ultimately uh, it will make us strive to to become uh, you know uh, better followers and to you know uh, develop some of his uh, his noble traits